Welcome to 2021 Edge. Hey, TikTok faces new legal challenges over its tracking of underage user data. John Mueller uh, celebrates the new year, giving a lot of great feedback back to SEOs. And we're also talking biased language models that can result in internet tra training data. This is our first news show on 2021. You're listening to News on the Edge, Edge of the Web Radio. From the Edge of the Web Studios, here's what we're looking at this week. Well, this is a treat. We are in the new year and we're not looking back, right? <laughs> Absolutely not. This is Edge of the Web Radio. I'm your host, Aaron Sparks, owner of Site Strategics. Uh, every week we bring you amazing guests to chat about digital marketing trends uh, happening right here each and every week. Uh, we're covering SEO and digital marketing news. And we have our separate weekly interview with marketing experts from around the planet. So check that out as well. But we're getting more news to you even more quickly uh, each and every week. So check out all of our show information over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edge of the webradio.com. Uh, welcome to the Site Strategics Digital Marketing News Desk of Edge of the Web. Uh, joining me this week to get their take on the news uh, is Morty Oberstein, SEO uh, liaison of Wix, and George Wynn, uh, editor over at Third Door Media. How are you guys doing today? Oh, great. Thanks for having me back again. You're more than welcome, man. You were kind of you were kind of on the fence there, weren't you? You're wondering whether or not we were going to put the call in. I, you know, I, I, I know how I am. I get it. I would understand. I would understand. <laughs> George. I'm back too. And I, I knew you would, I knew you would all be back. So <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like a bad penny, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> wow. This is a treat. It's, it's Aaron and George at the same time. At the same time. At the same wow, time. What a great way to start off 2021 outside of the fact that all my kids are back home and locked down again. But other than that, <laughs> oh, it's great. Geez. <laughs> I'm very sorry to hear that. You are treating them well, right? Yeah, they're all, yes, they, they get to come out of their cages once a day and eat. It's good. <laughs> and then go back into the box of shame, right? Right. It's called, it's called, the, the box of shame is called their room with the TV. <laughs> yeah, how, how, yeah, exactly. How, how do they want to not leave? I mean, my kid's got his Xbox and computer. And we're trying to pry him down to go, go, go do something outside. I say, no, I got, I got everything right here. Dude, this I had a kid in isolation. He came out for two weeks. Like, let me back in. I don't want to be with you people. <laughs> Literally, that's basically what he said. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> poor kid. Yep. Yep. Uh, George, you got any kids? No, I'm going to stay away from the parenting tips from SEOs. I mean, I, <laughs> I, it's just, you, you get here from people around you and you're just like, oh man, why would I do that? You I have dogs. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the testing we're doing that's getting us in trouble with the kids. Like yes. we try new tests. <laughs> yeah, we're experimenting on the, on a regular basis, and uh, I mean it's the small things in life that really. I mean the perks. I mean nothing's illegal, right? I did try to sell my kids on eBay once. There's a law there, evidently. I hope this uh, <laughs> this year turns up for you, Morty. If this is the highlight so far, four days, <laughs> four or five days in. But you know, I have low standards. <laughs> well, you know what? We there. know. We know. <laughs> We're going to try to raise those standards on a regular basis, Morty. So uh, that's our mission this year, and we're we're not looking back at uh, 2020 at all. Oh, I said it. Oh, all right. Well, we'll catch that in post. All right. So I wanted to bring these gentlemen on because we have some good stories to to tackle for our first news uh, show of the year, and uh, especially as uh, the article we're going to be talking about. Our third article is George's, and uh, we wanted to bring him on. But first, out of the gate, we're talking about tick. TikTok. Uh, TikTok faces new legal challenges over its tracking of underage user data, uh, despite facing an array of challenges, which at times threaten the app's very existence. TikTok has continued to grow in 2020 and looks to set, uh, set to become an even more important and influential platform in the year ahead. Uh, they have a number of great points. This is from uh, Social Media Today. Uh, author is Andrew Hutch Hutchison. He's always bringing some great information. Um, unfortunately, or I guess the uh, point being, uh, there actually there is a, a, a legal proceeding happening in the UK. Uh, quote, uh, a 12-year-old girl from London who cannot be identified plans to bring a damages claim against six firms said to be responsible for TikTok and its predecessor app Musical.ly for the loss of control of personal data. According to a high court ruling published on Wednesday, the action alleges the firm Firms have misused the claimant's private information and, and processed the claimant's personal data in breach of 
EU and UK data protection laws. Now, we also know that EU and, 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 uh, and the UK have been further ahead on data privacy, and we're certainly catching, catching up with them here in the States. Um, but could this actually represent um, another chapter uh, of, of pushback from the digital users, the digital consumers, when they start seeing their children's privacy further and further get um, uh, get, get revealed or, or at least uh, 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 taken advantage of. Um, it's one thing for the adult users, the adult parents to actually, you know, uh, 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 kind of waive their rights, uh, just wanting to be on these different different platforms. But all of a sudden, we're seeing more and more cases like this of of the youth being exploited. We got to protect uh, our our children's privacy. And uh, uh, could this very well be uh, canary in the the coal mine of of another another chapter of big tech uh, going a little bit too far? Uh, uh, Morty, I'm going to ask you first. What are your thoughts there? I mean, look, the the whole thing here, and this, if, unless I'm wrong, like. It's very easy to get past the uh, the protections here. Like, it's, there's not a lot of you know, barriers. I, I I'll compare it to almost like you know, like you go online and you buy a whiskey, mm -hmm. which I I would never do. Um, Guilty. I actually I, have done that. I just did that like five minutes ago. <laughs> but <laughs> right, so they have a thing like, are you over eighteen? Uh, yeah, no, sure, exactly. and th and that's it. You're done. Right. Like, the access to the. Uh, it's like almost in reverse, like the access to the information or the access to give out your your information. It, it's too easy, and it is a problem. Like, look, I have kids. I would never let my kids near TikTok. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely not. No. Now I'll turn it to George. George, what about your kids? <laughs> don't let your dogs near TikTok. Well, if I had kids, I uh, I don't go on TikTok myself because I like to have um, free time not spent that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's a stupid. knock. Uh, on anyone who enjoys the platform, but of course, that's not um, what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Everything's touchier when it comes to children, and we've come to this point in society where, you know, if I had messed up my life making a terrible decision, yep. which I may have already and don't know about, uh, but, you know, that kind of stuff happens, and you're an adult. Um, when I grew up, the internet was, I didn't have it until I was maybe like 10, mm -hmm. and so if you're making a mistake, you've had more years of life under your belt, but now children have that opportunity very, very early on. Absolutely. And like Morty said, all you're doing is clicking a box. There's nothing really there. I'm not familiar enough with the, uh, the details of this story, but I would say that uh, how children interact with platforms is something that really needs to change. Absolutely. I mean, the only thing stopping younger users from logging on and accessing all TikTok has to offer is a fairly loose age gate, just like Morty was talking about. So um, it's it's not about, and I guess this is the point, it's not about the age gate of just clicking through and saying yes and getting access to everything. There's got to be a responsibility on the big tech side of things. Um, not allowing that to happen and being able to have a structure that, that uh, can verify not the approval of, but verify the age of your of your consumer, of your user, beyond just a button click. And I think that's what I'm really talking about here. Isn't the onus on the platform to actually guarantee the 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 uh, the youth are protected, not just offering up a button click? Because uh, that's where we have been for uh, waiving uh, waiving rights or or terms and conditions on Facebook. Yeah, just get through it, uh, get on to the next page so we can see our stream, right? But when it comes down to kids, there's got to be a level of responsibility and accountability on the big tech side of things, gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, look, that's all this is, right? Why do they have that box there? Because they really care. Yeah, we're yeah, we're yeah. very concerned about children's privacy, so we put a really easy box that anyone, any 13-year-old, like, what's the threshold on, on TikTok, 14? <laughs> oh, it's for 14-year-olds. I'm not going to go there. Right. Like, please, they only put it there. It's a it's a legal check, so they don't get in trouble. It's a, right. it's a cover your ass. And no, they, that, no. shouldn't, that shouldn't be allowed. That's crazy. No, it, it really is. Um, uh, any final thoughts on that, George, before we go on? In some countries, they uh, tie registration, like South Korea does this, they tie registration to uh, platforms and pretty much um, anything of consequence to your uh, citizen ID number, your social security number, whatever they call in those countries. Sure. And that does, that might work. But the other issue is you might have a situation where um, 
in a place like America, you're used to having anonymity Mm -hmm. to some extent. You're able to hide that you're not actually this person. Like my name might not actually be George and none of you would really know that. Um, But in Korea, the government knows that and the entities have to verify that. And so if they're verifying for your real age, according to your social security number, then you have that much more security, but also you lose in anonymity, personal anonymity. So yeah. there's that trade-off to think about as well. Yeah, that's a huge slippery slope that, uh, uh, I mean, freedom is is the, the coin of the realm, so to speak, in, in uh, our neck of the woods. And boy, that would be a hot and contentious battle right there to have a have a, uh, a, uh, a an ID card, uh, a digital ID card, for lack of a better description, uh, to be able to be tied to your governmental ID. Boy, that would, I mean, there's so much fear already happening in this space. Uh, I, I just couldn't see that happening. Uh, but a good contribution on both parties. Thank you so much. Next story, uh, John Mueller was contributing on New Year's Eve. Uh, and he was actually helping webmasters both in public forums and privately, according to Barry Swartz over at Search Engine Roundtable. Uh, there's a number of public responses that, jo- uh, that John made during the New Year's Eve 2020. Yeah, said it again. And New Year's Day 2021. Uh, a couple key points. Uh, uh, Salamat Ali said, how many days does a disavow? link reduce spam score john chimed in we don't have a spam score at google so you have to have my permission to make up a a number (laughs) you'd like um a couple other contributions uh uh Alan <laughs> Blywis, uh, we had a good threaded conversation uh, with Alan. Uh, breaking, breaking, Google confirms SEO won't be dead in 2021. Happy New Year to our industry. Uh, when John says, well, not in the first weeks. <laughs> Uh, anyway, he was giving some great feedback back. Uh, Lily Ray jumped in there. My SEO dream for 2021 is for SEO tools to stop providing businesses with urgent SEO recommendations that are not actually urgent. If we can spend less of our time justifying why we are not focusing our efforts on non-issues, that would be great. And John chimed in there, prioritization in SEO is sometimes super hard. It's easy to find tons of issues. Uh, It's hard to pick the two that will move the needle more than working on something new. Uh, But also, you need to have busy work to clear your mind, which is uh, having a ton of issues to to help with. She actually posted, and I think a a further thread, or maybe it was a a separate comment, that she got an alert that she had zero 301 redirects on her website. And she's saying... Why am I even getting that alert? Anyway, a great a great deal of uh, a contribution from John on New Year's Eve. So what the heck was he doing on New Year's Eve to, to, to churn up all this information? But it was really a, a good series of, of uh, givebacks to the SEO community. Uh, Morty, what are your thoughts there? John Mew staying up. He probably, well, hopefully he wasn't drunk typing. I mean, that would be terrible. <laughs> oh, he's definitely a party animal. I mean, you can you can clearly tell from oh, that. He loves cheese. I know that animal. much. That but that's a whole. There's a story about that. I don't think he actually like. I mean, I think he likes cheese. Yeah. I think the cheese thing was like a gag with Gary. Really? Yeah. I wouldn't doubt that. I wouldn't doubt that at all. But uh, I like the Lily Ray take thing. I mean, I have a I have a lot of hot takes about that. Having worked <laughs> for a uh, SEO software company before, but um, my favorite is I'm um, watch out. Your links are going to result in a manual action. Like, like, come on. Like, please. 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 But, but, I mean, you could at least, uh, I mean, it does create a lot of busy work, right? It, it creates a lot of, like, hey, you know, this is the problem. Like, like um, I, know, I don't know if we're getting off the beaten path here about this topic, but, yeah. you know, the platforms are in a sort of a sticky point. Some of them, at least. Some of them, like, you know, they're enterprise platforms and it's much easier. But when you have a wide audience mm-hmm. and you're trying to speak to newer people and you're trying to speak to your SEO experts at the same time. So they're sending out these alerts because, hey, to the new person, this is great. Right. To the SEO expert, we just kind of crap all over it because it's basically SEO spam. Right. That's what it is right there. Yeah. Right. So I get what they're trying to do. I think they just need to do it a little bit differently. And give you give yourself the the ability to to filter what you really want to see coming at you as opposed to just garbage, garbage, garbage. Because so I mean, how do you know I'm going to get a manual action? You know, you know. Right. No idea. <laughs> George, what do you think about the the SEO spam we get from these reports? I feel like they could be much more streamlined uh, and triaged in a way that's like, hey, here's like really low tier stuff. Or, you know, if you have zero, you know, <laughs> negative warnings or whatever, that could all kind of be condensed in one place. But I also know that SEOs 
love their data, yes. right? We are the people that will actually say, hey, I only need 50 more followers to get to 2,000 on Twitter. <laughs> Nobody, no other sector cares about your KPI, that. right? I love that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I just for the record, everybody listening to this podcast, I only need like seven more thousand to ten thousand. <laughs> so hey, give me a give me a follow. Oh my gosh, are I'm you literally follow Morty right now? Uh, yeah, I think we'll do we'll do that a, we'll do that a couple times just to to pique your interest. There, we'll follow and unfollow. Wow, you're literally doing that, that like a like like a a follow grab during the podcast, Morty. Come on, I have no shame. No, you do not. You're lucky I'm wearing clothes. Oh my gosh. This is a podcast. <laughs> All right. So uh, we're going to have to deal with our SEO spam, but for the software tools, please train, uh, give us the ability to train this messaging, but kudos to John. Uh, he certainly didn't have to uh, share a lot of information during uh, New Year's Eve. And we, and that just shows some solid commitment uh, to the SEO community at large. Uh, so thanks to him on that. All right. So thanks to our continued sponsor uh, on the edge. That's a H refs. Uh, H refs makes competitive ad analysis. Very, very easy. Their tools show you how competitors are giving, getting their traffic from Google and why. You can see the keywords, the ranking on the links that are bringing them traffic and value. From there, you can actually replicate and improve on their strategies. Got a lot of great tools over there, especially the Link Intersect tool and the Audit tool is fastly becoming a, a favorite of mine. So go over there. Uh, you can get seven days for seven dollars, uh, uh, an entire week of, a, of, a, of the full functionality of Hrefs. Uh, they're a fantastic partner, and we enjoy having them into the new year. All right, uh, that that's our. Uh, couple of articles. Now we want to jump into a, a pretty sizable article that George wrote here. Uh, was that uh, the 30th or the 31st that you posted that article there, sir? I can't remember. That was the 29th. I mean, Doesn't really matter. Yeah, tw it, this is 2021. It is. Now. Uh, 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 that's right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're looking ahead. It, it, it must have been 20. It was December 29th, 2019. I just completely refused to even acknowledge the year. All right. So biased language models can result from internet training data. Now, there's a controversy around AI re researcher uh, Tunet Gebru, uh, her exit from Google, and what biased language models may mean to the search industry. So, um, not to put, not to just speak George, George's words, but let's tee it up, is that we have actually gone through a number of algorithm changes and updates uh, that uh, Google announced BERT uh, early uh, in uh, 2019, as well as an update to BERT last year. That, the, the, it's the Boulder year. Yes, it's the year that we shall not mention ever again. There we go. So nearly five years ago now, it actually powers almost every English-based query. Right. Uh, this is BERT. And however, the language models like BERT are trained on large data sets and there are potential risks associated developing language models this way because they have a predominance of English search queries that are training these models. So I didn't tee it up nearly as well as you can. George, give us a, a, a construct here of what we're talking about when it comes down to language training models for search queries. All right, so um, just going back there, BERT, I believe, was rolled out in um, yep. uh, October of 2019. Yep. And now it's at, at ten, it was at 10% of uh, English language queries when it rolled out. That was the estimated number that Google gave us. And now they've told us at their search on event last year that that number has gone up to nearly all of the English language queries. But moving forward um, to what you asked, we don't know if this is BERT. We don't know if... Um, it's some other language model. We're speaking in somewhat broad strokes, especially because the research paper wasn't available when I wrote that, and to my knowledge, it still isn't available. Right. So the idea here, if you didn't catch the article, was uh, that training these language models, you need extremely large data sets, and a great place to turn to that is the internet. However, the internet contains an immense amount of bias when you just think about the nations that got the internet first mm -hmm. and what the most prevalent language is on the internet. Um, those biases to you and me, people who uh, I'm assuming you grew up in America or at least in, in the you know Western hemisphere, um, that it might not be apparent at all because this is the internet you have had since forever, mm -hmm. but there is an alternate way to view the world 
And that won't be reflected in these language models because they're simply being trained off of existing data sets. You know, and of course, there's steps being taken to remove that bias. But theoretically, this could make its way, uh, uh, internet bias could make it its way into a data set, which then gets used to train a language model, mm -hmm. which may then be inserted into an algorithm. And that could be used in uh, the auto suggestions. Yep. It could be used in the um, the fetching, the ranking process, possibly. We don't know where that's going to manifest. And right now, I feel like we're still kind of in the early days. I mean, the things that we've been able to do with natural language processing have been amazing, but they're pretty rudimentary compared to what's happening here with you and me and Morty. We are verbally communicating. We're exchanging information. That doesn't happen in the same sense on a search engine. But one day, we might get closer to that. And if we're training consistently on biased language models, then we are thus possibly optimizing content for bias, right. for biased algorithms and perpetuating this cycle. So that is the major thing that I zoomed in on there. Of course, there's also the um, uh, environmental impact of train, training large data sets. There's a colossal amount of CO2 created um, or allegedly, it's, they're all associated risks. So mm -hmm. we don't know exactly how big these risks are but they're worth paying attention to for sure. Sure, now now the association of uh, the bias training, the, the regional bias training, so to speak, um, is not just, it's in it, and I wanna make sure our listeners understand, it's not talking about a morality bias or a particular uh, uh, philosophy bias. We're talking about entities, we're talking about relationships of concepts. And you're, you're dealing with an English relationship by and large uh, a, a, of, of one entity as it, re, a, as it relates to another entity. And if you're in an echo chamber and you're saying that th this, this country or this particular city is only in this particular country, for example, you could actually be not, you could be reinforcing a break of relationships in another country because there is that city named for that particular named in that particular country, and it's just not being understood completely because it is an English-oriented training model. Yeah, I gave a really poor example there, but uh, uh, Dawn Anderson was actually on the show uh, uh, last year, and uh, boy, she ran, 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 ran through uh, natural language processing and understanding that that there's such a tight relationship. Uh, if you're if you're codifying it with English relationships, you're you're pretty much ignoring the rest of the world. Is that, is that what we're talking about here? Uh, you, well, I, as somebody who speaks a few languages, hmm. the language that you primarily think in really formats your mind a certain way. So, for example, there's not a such a rigid um, distinction between the present tense and the future tense in languages like Japanese oh, sure. and uh, and Chinese and Vietnamese. And so that means that you're not always thinking in the present tense, which means if you said a statement in English, like I will save, that means that you're not saving now, mm -hmm. right? But that language between I am saving now and I will save in the future is much more similar, if not identical. It could be that an identical sentence in different languages. And so that outlook changes everything about the way you live your life. And that's just kind of my spiel as somebody who's into communication, not necessarily sure. you know, the guy who wrote the article. But um, if you haven't looked at any of Don Anderson's work, she's published on Bird and things like that, the relationship between words, just a lot of great examples. And if you just think about the way the word for is used and how many possible definitions there are, am I talking about the number four right. or am I talking like, oh, this is for you, right? All of that is extremely complex and the nuances there are extremely important to capture. With regard to bias, there's a lot of nuance. Mm -hmm. And there's also all of these movements, like uh, you know the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, that you could perhaps visualize as, as counteracting some of the bias or moving the bias in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But these are relatively new. And when you think about all the text that exists from the past, like there are so many uh, books. I forgot what what that uh, what it's called when a book becomes. I think it's like open domain or something um, when books just become freely oh, available, right? Domain. And they all yeah, reflect, yeah, yeah. yeah, public domain. Right. They all reflect that kind of bias because that's just how things were, and we're moving forward. But we need to be able to keep this bias either um, 
in check or we need to be able to display that something is biased, especially in the search <clears throat> results. <clears throat> Pardon me. Understood. That was a, that was a much better example of, of uh, how, how, yeah, how one could infer uh, so many different types of uh, 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 perspective out of one sentence. Yeah, everything. And this is where Google is. It's, it's an entity relationships and it's trying to discern how things are actually related to the, each other and understand consumer intent. Um, Morty, I want to get you in, in play here and uh, get, give you a little bit of time to talk about uh, what we're talking in this in this AI training mod uh, model that we're talking about here. There's a long way to go uh, before we can honestly kind of trust that uh, we're not in our own echo chamber, right? Yeah, well, that's a fu the funny thing is about, about all this is, is that one, one is... I don't know if it was you or George mentioned this, but bias is like, there's a little bit of bias in the word bias. Right. It, it happened very accidentally. I think one of the, um, there was a study out of maybe Japan in 2015, 16, I don't remember, like I'm terrible with years. But basically they, they found there was a bias in images that for um, Western Caucasians in data sets. Mm -hmm. Why? Because like whoever was working with that data set, their association to people is white Caucasians. And that might necessarily, like, if you're from Finland, that just, that's just going to be your association to people. And it's not like some sort of nefarious, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm racist or biased. That's just your relationship to the world. And that impacts what you put into these data sets. And this study out of Japan, I think it was found, like, yeah, like, in this particular data set they were looking at, there was a there was a bias because there wasn't enough non-Caucasians put into the data set, but that wasn't done on purpose. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a sort of like understanding that it's very easy for that to happen and it can happen without you knowing it's going to happen. And Google actually, the surprising thing about this whole story, George, at least to me, this was surprising, is that Google had something back, and I don't remember, again, I'm terrible with the years, I'm going to look at what it was called, I totally forget, Google's Inclusive Images Competition. Do you remember this? This was like Google was saying like um there there that they, Google recognized there was a problem out there with data sets and and a and AI and machine learning that it was biased. There mm. wasn't enough, you know, diverse information being input. Right. And one of the one of the examples that it gave was like um I think it had to do with weddings. That the the image data sets around if you search for a wedding, not Google, but the other data sets Google was looking at would say, oh. Uh, weddings, that must be like a Judeo-Christian idea of a wedding. And then when it saw other um, examples of weddings, let's say from, you know, Africa or from, from the, middle, the Middle East mm -hmm. or from, you know, Southeast Asia, whatever it is, it wouldn't understand that was a wedding. Got it. Because it's biased to the idea that a wedding must be like, you know, your typical Judeo-Christian version of a wedding. So the irony is that Google went out there trying to fix bias in data sets. And then now is having a hard time on their own admitting there's bias in data sets. <laughs> no, that's that's the thing. Um, and, and and part of this problem and, and a, a good fo a focus of George's article was about the study that Gabriel did uh, in 2018. She she's actually most known for uh, 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 digging into facial an analysis software, showing an error rate of 35 percent for dark skinned women compared to less women compared to less than one percent for light skinned men. So so she did recently just release a, an article that's kind of in dispute with Google over uh, oh, the, the article's name on the dangers of stochastic uh, parrots. Can language models be too big? Discussing the possible risks associated with training language models on large data sets. So uh, she was informed that her resignation has also been expedited while she was on vacation and she was actually promoted two months prior. So what do you make of that, George? Uh, so the, as far as I know, the, um, can you read the name of the paper one more time? Yeah, it's yeah. so hard to read. On the dangers what? of stochastic parrots, can language models be too big? <laughs> right. And uh, so that's the, the report in question, the paper yeah. in question that, um, as to my knowledge, is not publicly available. Although mm -hmm. uh, you can look at redacted versions of it just simply by Googling it. People have uploaded PDFs and I was able to go over that a little bit. Uh, yeah, so that is the main thing that people know this story from, especially if you're not uh, involved in the AI space, is mm -hmm. that there is an, a leading uh, AI researcher who is black who got let go of Google under some sort of controversial terms. And that is the main plot of the story. The AI ethics part is the subplot, but to us, it should be the other way around. Right. And, you know, you led with that, Aaron, but 
this is also, it, it's another fold in the story because she is this researcher who is an advocate for diversity mm -hmm. and she's being let go. And so that's always a bad look, but she's also trying to maybe not sound the alarm, but definitely draw attention to these issues uh, about the risks associated with training AI, uh, natural language models on large data sets. And so all that kind of folds together and there's a lot of nuance that can get lost in there. But when we're just thinking about this, um, it, it's hard to imagine that she wanted to resign, right? but it, it was, she did say it. She just said, she said that, um, you know, if we can't, you can't meet these terms and we're gonna have to go our separate ways. And when you open the door like that, then the company could just be like, is that a threat? And so I, I don't really have that much to weigh in on um, the separation. Although I do feel like a lot of people in Google have been drawing a lot of attention to the company's yeah. policies regarding uh, diversity or harassment and things like that. Absolutely. And they are not really, they're, they're not treated the way you would expect a company that started out the way that Google did. Mm -hmm. um, they seem to be getting forced out. And like I said in my article, she's part of a growing number of people who have dissented and no longer work for the company. Right. No, there's an entire, uh, on medium.com, there's an entire Google walkout dot medium.com standing with Dr. Timit Gabru. Uh, there's 4,000, 5,000 as, as oh, I'm sorry, 2695, uh, uh, 2,695 Googlers and 4,300 academic industry and civil society supporters supporting her and what has happened here. But news breaking just right now, literally there's a new union that's starting to be formed. Uh, and I don't know how large it is, but it's starting to pop in, in on Twitter. And that is the Alphabet Union. And so there's a number of uh, workers that are wanting to kind of push back and and protect uh, the, the, the Googlers of the world. It's a small uh, monicum compared to uh, how large Google is, but you're certainly seeing some some changes happening as as we've all been processing Google as a very altruistic, um, uh, uh, diverse organization, or at least that's what we've been sold on, right? You know, it's like funny because Google sometimes in, in SEO, right? right? They are so good. Their optics are sometimes wonderful, Absolutely. but then sometimes not so great, right? Um, you know, the, the dominance of SERP features on the SERP, not a great optic. But, but it's like amazing to me, like how terrible they are in this in this particular area whether mm -hmm. or not they're wrong or they're right i'm not getting into that sure the optics are just like absolutely like terrible like look in this particular case right i maybe i didn't see it so maybe i'm wrong and george probably knows better than i will so if he can correct me on the spot but why not come out and say like yes like there are definitely concerns about bias in 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 data sets and it's a major problem not just with google but across the board by the way this has happened to google before mm -hmm. right there was some kind of like um there's some kind of like data set they were looking to see um, um negative sentiment on on on, on social media something like that and it mm -hmm. came out that like i think the nist came out and said that there was bias in google google was biased against tweets from african americans oh, and geez. calling them n n negative or whatever the 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 um the, the categorization was. So it's mm -hmm. not like the first time Google's been put on the spot for having bias in their in their data set. Right. And look, it's a, a own that. Like, yes, it's a problem. Yes, mm -hmm. we need to work on this. We're working on it. Blah, blah, blah. And if there is a particular problem you have with that particular employee, mm -hmm. so do that quietly on the side. Yeah, so I, I just don't get it. No, it's it's getting way too public, and they're not they're not they're not taking the steps to be able to. And again, we don't know what really happened, and let's, let's put that big asterisk right there. Is we don't know the relationship. We don't know. There's been a number of position statements uh, from uh, uh, m m m Dr. Gebru, um, but uh, all things being equal, we know that there are data biases, number of individuals are contributed into the article, Brittany Mueller, um, a, a number of them uh, that, that you uh, connected with, George, certainly are, are sharing the same, you know, 
their perspective on the on the topography that we're uh, what we're seeing here in Serbs. Right. The the unambiguous um, the unambiguous responses that I got from the professionals I talked to that work in AI or you know tangential to the space mm -hmm. was that internet text if you're training natural language models with them you can absolutely create. Um, biased models, and that would happen anywhere right. where you're doing that, and not just simply at Google. Of course, Google is the market leader by a long shot, and that's why we're talking about it. But with with all of this, you you have to see that, and this is like the last paragraph that I put at the end there. Mm -hmm. If you're letting go of somebody because you might feel um, like they're like, what if Google, what if everything that Je um, Jeff Dean, I think uh, was the name of the SVP in charge of the communications here at Google AI um, said was accurate and, and everything was true and everything that Tim Nick could have been, could have said is true as well, right? Mm -hmm. There's, this isn't really conflicting information about the terms under which she left Google. Right. Um, there's just a dispute over whether or not she was fired. So I guess the uh, unemployment checks might be a little bit hazy there, but <laughs> the question is, the underlying motives, are you just wanting to, to her to uh, highlight more of what companies are doing to root out this bias that isn't reflected in the paper? Was the, bias, was the paper itself biased, oh. right? Which is an interesting to th thing to think about because people are trying to do things, but because these language models are so wide reaching, identifying bias is gonna be extremely difficult. And when you allow something to be published with your researchers, um, you know, leading there, it's, you have to think, this creates a sense of accountability for your company. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to take on that accountability? And perhaps it, it just came down to like friction in the team. Sure. Like, hey, you needed to give us more time here. Maybe we were actually starting to uh, review papers more thoroughly. There's a lot of other Google researchers that have said, I've had my papers reviewed not for um, so much how thorough everything was, but just how it kind of uh, portrayed Google. Hmm. But what Google was saying is that, oh, no, you're not. The content here isn't uh, what we want. We want you to add in more of uh, the more recent research to show that it's not all bad. Wow. So the commitment is to me what is in question, but that's my personal opinion. I, we, we can't just, you know, we're throwing darts at sure. what Google might be thinking here. No, absolutely. And this just happened in December. So we don't know uh, what's to come. Uh, we certainly do see that there's uh, some some movement, some activism uh, on behalf of uh, the workers of Google and uh, the Googlers, uh, but we're we're certainly going to watch it and and uh, pay attention because it does have uh, so much to do with how SERPs actually are presented worldwide, internationally, and uh, and there is such an investment of time and money into understanding how we can communicate uh, to a better degree. We we certainly want to. Pay attention to the inner workings, and boy, you just hate that everything gets stilted into a PR piece. You know, that's what makes it so frustrating because that's what it feels like. Yeah, like that's what there it was feels a, like. There's, a, there's like, look in, in George in your article, Bing came out and said, yeah, like there's bias in language models. You didn't get that sort of transparent feel from Google. Nope. Saying like, look, we may disagree with the particular research here. We'll review it, but there was there was a lot. There wasn't a lot. There, there was no open dialogue about it. Mm -hmm. It was very let's push it under the carpet. And again, maybe that's not what actually happened because who knows? I'm, I'm not there. You weren't there. Maybe George was there, and he's not telling anybody. <laughs> but George probably wasn't there either. So we don't know. Again, like George said, we don't know what happened. But all the signs point to this not being about transparency, about trying to push us under the rug, and trying about a lot of inner friction going on here, and it's spilling out to the public forum, and it just it's not a good look, and it's not good for anybody. It's not good. It's not good for the. It, to quote Google, this is not good for the user. Ooh, see, F shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> I am nice. Nice. Mark. I love you, Google. <laughs> I love you. We all love Google here. All right. Uh, final words, George, uh, as the author of the article. Any uh, last thoughts there? Uh, there is something that I wanted to tie into the article, um, but there wasn't a really natural uh, point to do that. Mm -hmm. And I just left it as a link within the article was um, in, in Brittany Muller's quote, I, 
added a hyperlink about uh, ways in which um, bias might be coming out that we haven't anticipated. And one of those ways was unfortunately a story back um, that uh, it was about data voids. Mm -hmm. And with respect to uh, anti-Semitic memes, right? These data voids are a situation that Google isn't really prepared for you. What do you do when somebody searches for something that not only has never been searched for before, but that you can't really interpret the intent of, and you can't, you don't have enough information to figure out what it means. Like if I brought up a term to you, I would totally with out of context, you, you might just stop me and ask, what does that mean? Or you might just nod your head. Right. Right. So Google doesn't have that ability. Of course they can just show you how oh, there are no relevant search results, but there's a threshold there. And when you, breach that threshold, you get things like uh, a seemingly okay search term. The search term in question for that particular story was, um, I believe, Jewish baby strollers. And so the memes that came out in the image results are extremely offensive. Mm -hmm. This is just one way in which, who could have foreseen that? Right. I mean, you, like now that it's in the rear view and we know about it. We're like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I feel like we're going to be doing that with some form of bias in nat natural language processing. I don't know what way it's going to come, but at some point, somebody, some user is going to say, that's racist or that's sexist. And then it's going to be a screenshot. Mm -hmm. And then Google is going to have a statement about, oh, we, we couldn't have seen this coming. And this is why we are either going to take it down or we're not. And so it'll kind of come down to your ethics, but, you know, is it good for the user that those kind of search results are there? That's, uh, I mean, it really comes down to how you define intent. And when you make that, that verdict, when you deliver that verdict, mm -hmm. it's, it will forever define an aspect of your company. That's a precedent. Right. And can you really blame a company for shying away from that? No, but when it's Google, you kind of want to, you kind of want to be like, no, there are too many people that rely on you and echoing this kind of thing or putting this kind of content in front of people can really put people into a rabbit hole or change views. And at some point, perhaps that won't be acceptable, but they've been doing what they've been doing for over two decades. And you can see how the internet has changed and evolved forward. So there's that progress, but on the other side of that progress, there's definitely something that we're missing. Yeah, it's a co contribution back from, I mean, we're the users of the engine. We got to give be able to give feedback and not lambast the company that is providing this because it's 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 a responsibility of the consumers to also um not not go so extreme. I mean, I understand when it comes down to racism and and uh, huge issues uh, of just just they completely fumble the ball on intent and you've got some very um, uh, uh, poor follow through on Google's side, but we do have a relationship uh, to these search engines to be able to provide that feedback back. We just, I would hope that Google and the other search engines would give, would give us the ability to contribute back into into this in in a number of different ways. They're a, a good deal more um, nondescript. That they're uh, they're they're a good deal more, I should say. Uh, open for communication and contribution. I think maybe that's the, the counterbalance to all of this. But otherwise, you're going to have companies that are afraid to or show any, uh, any type of content uh, for risk of being uh, offensive, right? You know, the, the problem, like, in, as I see it, in, in this particular case, I, I think that, is, yeah, it's a very hard question. Um, but I'll tell you, like, this is a great case, at least for me, the uh, Jewish baby stroller thing, because right. I didn't find out about it from the SEO community who went nuts, and rightfully so. My sister WhatsApp me and said, are you seeing what's going on? Like, this is all over the Jewish community right now. Oh, wow. Can you talk to one of your Google friends about this? So I went on Twitter. I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. And I had a whole conversation with Danny Sullivan about this. And this is not about, by the way, Danny was great. Danny was generally wonderful. He was a little bit different than Danny usually was about this particular topic. Mm -hmm. But in general, like, I don't put this on, on Danny. As a liaison on myself, like, it's a very hard place to be. And like, you don't have control over this. And maybe he personally agrees with what you're talking about, but he doesn't have the ability to to make any impact. Right. He may not even know who to speak to about this, right? So like, I don't want to put on Danny in particular, but Google seems to have very little plan about how to deal with this when it comes up. And in this particular case, like I understand like that's all the content there is, 
But would it be so hard to put a thing there? It's like you see it all the time in other places. Mm. Warning, offensive content. Do you want to keep clicking? Oh yeah. Hmm. Like now they I'm not saying they they can prevent the fact of knowing that that was going to be the result. I don't think anybody could have predicted that when you Google Jewish baby strollers, you get a grill. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yep. I don't like. There's no only a like an absolute sick psychopath would think like that's what that's going to show up. Right. Now that you know that it is showing up, is it that hard to put some sort of filter? They're saying like warning, this is offensive content. Blah 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 blah. Right. Like you see that with um, you know, I don't know if you've seen the the Netflix series. Oh man, what the hell is it called? Um, Eleven Reasons Why, Thirteen Reasons Why. Thirteen's are yeah, before, yeah. right before before each show. I mean, whether or not you agree, it's a good or bad solution. There's a disclaimer, but at least there's that disclaimer there at minimum. George is going to weigh in. One of the yeah, I, I am absolutely going to weigh in. <laughs> One of the things that uh, I wanted to discuss, but was that just outside of the range of the um, the article was the way that you could possibly go around and um either provide warnings or when in the context of search warnings just aren't enough you need to be able to prevent certain things from coming through or filter out the bias within the training sets right if that's even possible but you look at the way moderation has been executed by the biggest companies in the world and facebook just has battalions of moderators right. that the stories about their ptsd have been everywhere and so when you have a company just as big as, hmm. as Google handling more queries, more content, anywhere, the human aspect, like there's a reason that they don't rely on humans to do things except for the quality raters. And this is, the quality raters just don't do this kind of work. It's just not there. But right. for humans, there is that send feedback button. That's something that people don't look at because I feel like Google doesn't care if you see it because it is in size like six font at the very bottom of the SERP. And we all know that if you're below the fold, you're not seeing much in terms of listings. How many people make it all the way down there? And how many people have ever submitted feedback? Exactly. Right? It's almost you like a, really cursory, a cursory thing. Uh, again, uh, from a PR standpoint, yeah, we have something right there. No, 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 make it overt make it part of your engagement with users i mean i don't mean to to uh, usurp you there george but you really should have that effort to be able to give us a channel to communicate right yes there should be much more that you can do right. and google should be promoting that because why, why wouldn't you it's better if it's better for the user experience and that's what you want right and you can also have that's point back to you. If the SERP changes in a way where SEOs don't like it, which is quite frankly, every single way that the SERP changes, SEOs don't really <laughs> like it, right? The only thing that you're going to like more on a SERP change is if they make the ad uh, label bigger, right? That's the only thing for SEOs. But if you can point back to uh, this crazy amount of user feedback and be like, well, this is how they wanted things to change. Right. That's a defensible position. And no one is to argue that because you're like, well, yeah, that's true. You know, you're serving the user, we're serving the user, we're trying our best, but it's kind of edging us out, which puts us in this weird space. Hmm. But the scalability of solutions needs to be there because guess what content is going to just keep exploding. And these language models just need more and more information to be trained off of. So you can't just, as much as I would have liked to have seen somebody slap on a warning, a trigger warning, for that particular SERP or that search result. Right. Morty, I, I understand that that's not a sustainable thing to do, unfortunately, even though I would have been, loved to have seen that. Oh, I, in that particular case, right? And Google gave the slippery slope argument in this particular case. That to me doesn't fly. Like there's no, it's like there, in certain cases, yeah, it's like, you know, how do you, you're splitting hairs. Like, how do you know, like, where's the line? And, that, and that's a real question. Like I'm not delegitimizing that question. But a Jewish baby stroller is not a grill. Like, and it's just not. And there's no reason why that content should have been left out there to begin with. My point about there being some sort of like notification was like bare minimum in those cases where like you, you don't, you know, it is a slippery slope and that does exist. And I do understand Google's position. But in the case here where Google didn't do anything, hmm. it was pretty darn clear. Like this is just not, this is factually just not true. This is not what that is. And the, and the fact that there's so many white supremacists and racists who think that is the truth doesn't make it the truth. And it's a little bit disappointing in Google that they didn't do anything about it. So it's incredibly offensive and they do need to have uh, 
measured steps in, in things uh, outside of those type of extremes. But you also have to have a, a, uh, a uh, immediate reaction um, button whenever something like this comes up. Because, again, they're dealing with data and all of a sudden they find something. It could have been manipulated. It could have been, it could have been uh, uh, in one way, shape, or form, uh, pushed into, into content there by a lot of different factors. And they got to be able to extract not only the images, but also how it got there as well, because it just didn't bobble up to the surface. So there's other ramifications of this, but they do need to be able to be a much more reactive and re I should say, I'm sorry, responsive to this and be able to have a, a welcoming, welcoming uh, uh, perspective of feedback, not just a small button on the bottom of the screen. I think that's what we're talking about here. Right, gentlemen? Yeah. I mean, look, to that, to that point, my sister, did, like, if there was a big button there, it said, leave feedback. My sister would have done that. Right. Had my sister not known that someone in the SEO industry who happened to know Danny Sullivan, like th there would have been no recourse, and that's that's absurd. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Oh, gentlemen, uh, very, very interesting conversation. I really do appreciate the amount of time spent. Uh, we certainly will look to you uh, for continued uh, input on this. Uh, uh, George, fantastic article, and keep up the good work over at Search Engine Land. Uh, you got a final word for our, uh, our uh, Edge audience today? Oh, thank you, and please do check out the article. I, uh, about the, um, the Google Union, oh. I think that to uh to be in such a union you really have to like not care about your pay <laughs> <laughs> i mean these people are already making a colossal amount of money but good on them for being able to say hey you know what i don't need this and this doesn't align with my values because we are at the point where um startups or even like no not just startups but companies are paying so much that it makes your worries about the rest of the world not as hmm. pressing because your world is going just fine. But how long can we all be out there for just ourselves? Because if you're, you know, a straight white male worker at Google, I imagine things are pretty peachy. But how can you sit around and watch the person in the desk next to you maybe busting their ass, doing a lot more work and not getting that credit that'll wear away. And that's the kind of activism that we need to keep doing because at some point, it doesn't matter what company you are, you are going to face the repercussions of that mm -hmm. slowly in public opinion. And that's just going to destroy your business. Uh, people won't want to work there. And if they do want to work there, then they're already going to share the biased perspectives that you have. And how long can a company that just seeks to, you know, keep its own culture going, how long will that be around, honestly? No so I'm be. glad it's happening. There's going to be measured steps, though. I mean, the pendulum can swing uh, so far one direction that uh, it can really cause enormous damage, right? So everything needs to be governed with a level of... of consideration for the future and uh, we could also be kind of a bull in the china shop breaking things uh, while we're trying to fix things at the same time um all right well thank you very much george and we certainly appreciate all, all your work morty uh you're back in the seat next week uh, any any words uh, of wisdom that you want to bestow upon the uh, edge audience be the bull in the china store be the bull in the china store be the bull in the china store <laughs> That's what that's we got. That's, that's, that's what we got out of 2020, right? I got a lot of things out of 2020. Most of them I can't share on this podcast. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm with Georgia. Like, there's no to quote the great Jim Morrison: "No one here gets out alive. You get yours. I get mine." Even these wow. big companies think, you know, I quoted Jim yeah, Jimbo. He yeah, he did. If these companies think that you're, there's not going to be a repercussion to this, there's not going to be consequences because we hey, we're so big. It doesn't work that way. No, it doesn't. Uh, lesson learned, and we're certainly watching watching this transpire. So we'll keep you updated, uh, Edge audience, as we come across these stories. And uh, we certainly appreciate everybody's contribution, gentlemen. All right, so that's it for the Edge news this week. Uh, coming up, we're going to be talking to Sam Tomlinson, and uh, as well as uh, Jason Bernard uh, coming up soon. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated when we go live with our show, as well as uh, different video pieces coming out from all of us over at Edge. Stay safe. Stay well. Welcome to 2021. And do not be a piece of
Cyber Driftwood. Talk to you very soon. Bye-bye.